Good afternoon, and welcome to the first medical update of this year. Today's web-based seminar is entitled, TB Technical Instructions for Civil Surgeons, Implications for Health Departments. My name is Eileen Napolitano, and I am the Deputy Director of the New Jersey Medical School Global Tuberculosis Institute. Today's program is sponsored by the Institute. The objectives of this webinar are listed on the on this slide. TB control programs have the responsibility and expertise for diagnosing and treating suspected and confirmed TB cases. Civil surgeons are to refer such cases to TB programs as part of the medical evaluation for adjustment of status applicants. This webinar will describe the roles of both partners and demonstrate how appropriate application of the civil surgeon TB technical instructions can make for better patient care and reduce transmission of TB in the community. This webinar was developed for health department staff to create a better understanding of the requirements for civil surgeons. Our speakers today are Ms. Rosalind Brown Fry, Dr. Mary Naughton, Ms. Kelly Bemis, and Dr. Felicia Dworkin. The seminar today will consist of several parts. After this introduction and some brief housekeeping details, Ms. Brown Fry will start us off with a background and overview of the role of civil surgeons and the adjustment of status process. Then, Dr. Naughton will talk about the implementation of the civil surgeon technical instructions for tuberculosis. We'll then hear from Ms. Kelly Bemis, who will share information from a knowledge and awareness survey. And finally, we'll end with a case presentation Dr. Fulton-Ward. Excellent. Good. Thank you very much. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're located. Thank you very much for having me. Um, again, my name is Rosalind Brown Frey, and I also want to introduce Melissa Lynn. Melissa Lynn is my coworker, and we're both adjudications officer at the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, or short USCIS. USCIS is part of the Department of Homeland Security and one of the agencies which oversees legal immigration to the United States. In accordance with this mandate, we adjudicate petitions and applications filed by foreign nationals who would like to come to the United States either temporarily or permanently. So last year, we handled over 4 million of such requests. Today, I'm going to give you a presentation. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about immigrants, why some intending immigrants may seek adjustment of status, why we have health-related grounds of inadmissibility and why they are important to this process, and the roles of all players, CDC, the applicant, civil surgeons, health departments, and also USCIS. I will explain who a civil surgeon is and also how one can become a civil surgeon. Immigrant, we're talking here about immigrants and medical examination, and an immigrant is a foreign national who seeks to permanently reside in the United States. In contrast, there are individuals who come to the United States, but only for a temporary period. These individuals are called non-immigrants, and examples of them are, for example, students who come and study in the United States, temporary workers, or visitors for business or pleasure. Yet others come to the United States because of humanitarian concerns, and they typically can remain in the United States as long as they satisfy that concern. Examples are listed here, refugees and asylees, who cannot return to their home countries because of a past or a future well-founded fear of persecution. To clarify, an immigrant is not a U.S. citizen. Before one can apply to become a U.S. citizen, you have to be in the United States for quite a considerable amount of time. There are two ways to obtain immigrant status, depending on where you're located. One is inside the United States or from outside the United States. If an individual is, in the United, is outside the United States, he or she can apply at the U.S. Consul abroad, which is the Department of State. If all paperwork is in order and the consul will issue them the visa that allows you to travel to the United States and to enter as an immigrant. These individuals who are coming like that as an immigrant are examined by a physician from the Department of State, so-called a trusted panel physician. Because these individuals enter as immigrants, they do not need to seek adjustment of status and they will also not be examined by a civil surgeon. However, if the individual is inside the United States because they've entered, for example, as an immigrant, he or she can get their immigrant status via adjustment of status. And by the way, immigrant status is also often referred to as green card. 
The application for this process is, is filed with USCIS, and if it's approved, USCIS will issue the green card. These individuals generally need a medical examination that is conducted by a USCIS civil surgeon, and that's what we're talking here about. The requirements for adjustment of status vary depending on the category under which the individual seeks adjustment of status. So it typically doesn't matter what the individual comes into the United States as long as once they seek adjustment of status meets the legal provision under which he or she seeks adjustment. Typically, individuals seeking adjustment must be beneficiaries of a petition, and the petition is a request from a sponsor, such as a family member or an employer, who wants that individual to come to the United States. The type of the petition determines then under what category the individual seeks adjustment. Sometimes, however, the law allows for adjustment of status because, the indi because of the individual status alone. While that is somewhat rare in the law, um, it is the case for refugees and asylees. So typically, a refugee and an asylees can seek adjustment of status if they have been present in the United States for one year and if they otherwise meet the legal requirements of the law. Irrespective, on the, on the, or regardless of the category under which the individual seeks adjustment, all individuals must be admissible to the United States before, they can, before their application can be approved. Inadmissibility is a condition that requires the individual, that, that, that applies to the individual and doesn't allow him or her to remain in the United States. There are many reasons in the law why an individual cannot um, come to the United States when it's inadmissible. For example, if an individual has committed a crime, there are certain grounds of inadmissibility that will bar him or her. However, the grounds of inadmissibility that matters most in this webinar, webinar is, of course, the health-related grounds of inadmissibility, and they're listed here, communicable diseases of public health significance, failure to show proof of required vaccinations, mental disorders with associated harmful behavior, drug abuse, or drug addiction. These conditions, the, the three there listed other than the vaccinations, are called Class A conditions, and they make an individual inadmissible and an adjustment of status application would not be successful. It is CDC, the government agency, that determines what type of conditions meet these inadmissibility grounds and what an individual can do in order to not be inadmissible. For this purpose, CDC publishes regulations that address the health-related grounds of inadmissibility and also issues guidelines, technical instructions for the medical examination of aliens in the United States that detail the parameters of a medical examination. If an individual is inadmissible on one of these grounds, they can, in most cases, seek a waiver. If the waiver is approved, then the individual may enter the United States despite the inadmissibility. The conditions of the waiver are strongly oriented on the purpose of the medical examination ground, uh, medical inadmissibility ground, and that is to protect the public health of the United States. So waiver will only be granted if the individual gets the appropriate treatment once in the United States. Class A conditions are the conditions that make an individual inadmissible according to CDC's regulations. An individual may have another medical condition upon coming to the United States an Im immigrant, but these conditions not necessarily make the individual inadmissible. And there are also typically another reasons why we would uh, um, deny adjustment of status. In the immigration world, these conditions are called Class B condition, and an example is diabetes. Because all individuals coming to the United States must be medically admissible, each foreign national who is an immigrant to the United States must undergo the medical examination. This is where the role of the civil surgeon will come in, because immigration officers, of course, do not have any medical knowledge. The admissibility determination is made by an, an, uh, an adjudications officer of USCIS based on the result of the medical examination conducted by a civil surgeon. So medical grounds of inadmissibility, by the way, are um, in effect since 1882, and the medical examination at that time was conducted by the Public Health Service as individuals were coming to the United States at the border. And according to the records of Ellis Island, for example, the initial medical examination was called the six-second exam because that's about how long it lasted, just about six seconds. And it consisted of public health officers observing immigrants walking upstairs to the Great Hall at Ellis Island to determine whether the immigrant had a condition that would hinder him or her to work or to take care of himself or that would pose a, a public health risk. So nowadays, the technical instructions are probably a little bit more detailed. So now, as, I, as you have kind of the basis on what is adjustment of status, I'm going to summarize quickly the roles and, of the players in the adjustment of status process, and let's start with CDC. So CDC 
CDC defines communicable diseases of public health significance, as we said in earlier slides. They determine the vaccination requirements. They promulgate regulations for the health-related grounds of inadmissibility. They set the parameters of the medical examination of aliens in the United States. Um, these technical instructions, by the way, are binding on all of the players um, to have the force of regulations, and I listed here the website. Finally, CDC um, advises USCIS if USCIS has to grant a waiver um, because, again, we cannot determine whether somebody would get sufficient, has made sufficient arrangements to treat a Class A condition. So they advise us. Adjustment of status applicants. In general, an adjustment of status applicant is required to have at some point in time of their immigration history um, a medical examination. So it depends, again, a little bit on whether the person seeks the status inside or outside the United States. But the extent of a medical examination for an adjustment applicant is typically depending on the category of the adjustment and also whether the individual has, examined, has been examined abroad, for example. An immigrant who is non-immigrant who is seeking adjustment of status um, has typically not been examined abroad before coming to the United States. So if, um, if, if they're seeking adjustment, they will have to have a full examination by a civil surgeon. A refugee, in contrast, if they're seeking adjustment of status, they typically have been examined outside the United States. And so once they seek adjustment of status in the United States, that medical examination is typically good, except for the vaccination requirements that the refugee has not received overseas. The role of the civil surgeon. The adjustment of status applicants will have to make an appointment with the civil surgeon before and complete the medical examination before filing the adjustment of status applicant with USCIS. A civil surgeon is a U.S. designated physician who has applied with USCIS to be designated and who is a licensed MD or DO in the state in which he or she conducts the medical examination. In addition, they must have four years of professional experience. Once designated, it is the duty of the civil surgeon to conduct a medical examination according to CDC's technical instructions and also to complete the results of the medical examination on Form I-693 that he or she then gives to the applicant. How do applicants find civil surgeons? Civil surgeons, are um, their contact information is listed on USCIS's website, and it's at the link that I'm uh, providing um, at the end of the slides. Sometimes adjustment of status applicants have to go and see a civil surgeon, but then the civil surgeon may refer the adjustment of status applicant to another physician or a health department. The reason for that is, is that it's the duty of the civil surgeon to make referrals when required on the technical instructions. And these referrals are sometimes either based on the fact that the civil surgeon found a TB condition or that the civil surgeon is otherwise unable to make a diagnosis. The technical instructions then require the civil surgeon to refer the individual for further medical evaluation to the appropriate health department in the case of TB or to another physician who can assist with resolving the uncertainty. Where, um, whether there is a it is the civil surgeon's duty to complete the appropriate parts of the Form I-693 and not of the department or the physician who actually receives the referral. Finally, the role of the health departments. Of course, they administer the TB control programs in the United States, and they do so irrespective of whether the person is an immigrant, a U.S. citizen, or an economist. It really doesn't matter. However, both departments may see the individual who is an adjustment of status applicant if the civil surgeon who is required to refer the individual to the TB control program after the medical examination reveal the TB concern. The second function list here is really nothing that has to do with the adjustment of status process, but health departments administer health-related programs for certain populations in the United States, and these populations include refugees and asylees who are eligible for health benefits based on the Department of Health and Human Services mandate. The third point, however, here, has a lot to do with adjustment of status. So in general, health department physicians are blanket designated civil surgeons who can complete the vaccination portion of the Form I-693 if the refugee is seeking adjustment of status. And health departments can only do that for refugees, not for any other um, adjustment applicant. So remember that I mentioned that an individual who is a refugee and who seeks adjustment of status does not need a full medical examination because the refugee has generally been examined abroad. So to make it easier for the refugee population who, is, who, um, population who are also recipients of HHS benefits, um, USCIS blanket designated health department physicians 
so that they complete the, vet, uh, the medical assessment, the vaccination assessment of Form I-693. A blanket designation means that the health department does not have to apply for a civil surgeon designation, and as long as the physician who is employed by the health department meets all the requirements of the civil surgeon and completes the form in accordance, to, in accordance with the instructions of Form I-693, USCIS will accept that document <coughs> as part of the adjustment of status application. Finally, the role of the USCIS. So once the individual files his or her adjustment application, um, including they have to submit all the paperwork, including the medical examination results, USCIS will adjudicate the application. As part of that adjudication, we will verify that the applicant has received the required medical examination from a civil surgeon and that the individual is not inadmissible. If the individual is inadmissible, USCIS will adjudicate the waiver request filed by the individual after having consulted with CDC on the appropriate treatment. Finally, USCIS designates civil surgeon and, of course, they administer the civil surgeon program. So in the next slide, I summarize kind of the process, and you can um, take um, your time maybe after the seminar and look at that, and if you have any questions, we're welcome to answer them. And I here I also summarized some of the information where you can read up on immigration and adjustment of status and also the civil surgeons. And uh, that will be for me, and I'm looking forward to answering any questions at the end of the seminar. Thank you very much, Rosalind, for sharing that clear description of immigrants and the roles of all of the partners in the status adjustment process. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mary Naughton. Dr. Naughton is a medical officer with the Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Health Branch in the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She will talk with us today about the civil surgeon's requirements in the evaluations of adjustment of status applicants. Mary, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. So I'll be talking to you today about a little more about inadmissible um, Oh, conditions about the role of the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine and its partners in the civil surgeon examination, about the technical instructions themselves, um, a bit about the role of health departments as delineated in the technical instructions, and then we'll just go through a few frequently um, asked questions. So um, let's go on to the uh, medical examination of aliens, the, the regulation. Um, says, again, the inadmissible or the Class A conditions, um, communicable diseases of public health significance. So we're just talking about the communicable diseases here that are inadmissible. They are active tuberculosis, Hansen's disease in its infectious stage, untreated syphilis, and then um, the other sexually transmitted diseases when they are untreated. As far as um, health department interaction with U.S. immigration, I wanted to get um, maybe a little more specific than uh, Rosalind did. We're talking about two distinct view, uh, groups, um, and she did talk about the medical examinations completed overseas by um, the panel physicians, and the health department will generally see um, this population soon after their U.S. arrival. So these will be immigrants or refugees who arrive with TB classifications, and you will then perform the follow-up. Or um, for refugees, um, you'll perform the comprehensive um, Health and Human Services funded post-arrival screening. So you'll be seeing them immediately after they come to the U.S., and they will have had panel physician exams over, um, overseas. And then the second group is the Change of Status Medical Examination Group. Um, so these exams are performed by civil surgeons. Um, by and large, these applicants did not have a panel physician exam overseas. One example would be the non-immigrant visa holders. And um, uh, they basically can adjust status at any time depending on their category. Um, the exception, as Rosalind was mention, mentioning, include refugees who do undergo the exam overseas but must see a civil surgeon or a designated health department for the vaccination requirements. So they don't receive the vaccines or the required vaccines overseas, um, but must have them to adjust status one year or more after arrival. And the only time that a refugee would require a full exam by a civil surgeon is if they entered the U.S. with a Class A condition. 
And I just want to also comment that it's very unusual for CDC to recommend that anyone enter the U.S. with um, a Class A um, condition. So with, um, we recommend for very few Class A TB waivers, and it's generally for children. And it's actually been, um, I, in my memory, it's been a couple of years since we've had a request for a Class A waiver for someone adjusting status in the U.S. As far as civil surgeon activities go for our division, um, our, our partners are the Division of TB Elimination and then USCIS. Um, USCIS administers the civil surgeon um, program, and um, uh, they have had um, oversight of the civil surgeon program. In distinction, it's, it's clear that um, Division of Global Migration and Quarantine has oversight of overseas medical screening. So we do have oversight of the panel physician program. The civil surgeon TB technical instructions um, were released in 2008. There was an important update in 2009 about the option of using IGRAs in place of the tuberculin skin test. Um, on our website, we have the TIs and the updates, uh, plus frequently asked questions. The USCIS website contains the I-693 form that the civil surgeons need to complete. The instructions for that form, uh, which address the concerns of the applicants and the civil surgeon, and also FAQs about the form. And I just want to show you a few screenshots of the technical instructions. So as you can see, here's the title. And all you have to do to go to these technical instructions, you actually don't have to know the whole link. If you just Google or otherwise search for CDC and civil surgeons, um, the link will come up to the civil surgeon technical instructions. And so this is one of the technical instructions. You know, there are separate ones for vaccinations, um, for the sexually transmitted diseases, for Hansen's disease. But there's a um, menu along the left side of the page, and you select um, uh, the TB technical instructions. So here's the title. Here um, is table of contents. And if you put your mouse over any of these lines in the table of contents and click, it will take you directly to the portion in the TIs um, that you need to look at. So we can see here there is a, a portion on role of the civil surgeon in the health department. Um, this goes through past medical history, review of symptoms, um, and then down here it gets more into the workup. Um, it talks about the chest x-ray, talks, um, I think what's important to you, required referrals to the TB control program of the local health department, recommended referrals, um, and then talks about classification of applicants um, and includes latent TB infection, needing evaluation for treatment. So down the very bottom here, you can see there's a few appendices, and those include a few tables and charts, which again go into referrals. The civil surgeon role, this just includes a few of the roles of the civil surgeon, but they are to confirm the applicant's identity by comparing facial appearance and signature with the government uh, document. We want to make sure, or they should make sure, that the person um, who is showing up for the examination, and um, also this should be done at the time that uh, blood is drawn, that the chest x-ray is taken, is uh, truly the person who is applying for the immigration benefit, so applying to adjust their status. Uh, they are responsible for administering the skin test, um, or arranging for the IGRA, and Appendix A in the TIs goes through um, DTBE's instructions about um, applying a, a TST. Um, and they are responsible for establishing a working relationship with the local health department TB control program in order to report suspected and confirmed TB cases as mandated by law and perform required and recommended referrals. Um, the required workup for TB um, includes cell-mediated immunity testing for applicants two years or more um, and to, of age in the U.S. This is different from overseas where we have different requirements, but in the U.S., if the applicant is uh, two years of age or greater, they have to have a TST or IGRA, and this is to determine if a chest X-ray is needed. So if the TST is five millimeters or greater or the IGRA is positive, um, 
then a chest X-ray is required. Um, sputum smears and cultures are required if the chest radiograph suggests TB, if there are signs or symptoms of TB, or if there's immunosuppression. Um, if there's HIV infection, uh, 15 milligrams of prednisone for one month or greater, or the equivalent, or a history of organ transplant. And um, the one thing that should be said, however, is that the civil surgeon is required to uh, refer the person to the health department if the chest X-ray is suggestive of TB. So while we say that sputum smears and cultures are required, we expect these actually to be done at the health department. And um, the referral to the health department is needed because, um, as we know, the expertise for diagnosing and treating TB in the U.S. resides at the health departments. And, um, you know, with very few exceptions. So we want the civil surgeons and we require the civil surgeons to actually take advantage of that expertise. And we certainly don't require referral before the chest x-ray, but if the chest x-ray is suggestive, we do require the referral. Um, drug susceptibility testing if the culture is positive. And then it's the civil surgeon's responsibility, not the health department's, to properly classify the person for tuberculosis, and that's according to the technical instructions, and this goes back to the regulations. This reflects the Class A and Class B um, designations that are in the federal regulations. So it's actually not the ATS classification. Um, also directly observe therapy throughout um, the course of treatment for Class A TB, and this is also what's required for overseas. Um, we do have um, this exception for cell-mediated immunity tests. Um, if there are prior positive results um, that are documented, um, then the uh, civil surgeon can go directly to chest X-ray. But there has to be written documentation by a healthcare provider of a TST result that is five millimeters or greater, or of a prior positive IGRA that's the most recent IGRA. The only exception we make where we would accept um, a history um, that's oral from the applicant is if there's a history of severe reaction with blistering um, to a prior TST. And as I said, in the above circumstances, then the civil surgeon would go directly to a chest X-ray. Um, and we say that they cannot perform another type of cell-mediated immunity test, um, that they need to go with one type or another. The chest radiograph is required for all applicants with a TST that's five millimeters or greater of induration or a positive IGRA, or um, if there are signs or symptoms of TB or immunosuppression. And the chest x-ray should be interpreted by a radiologist or other qualified physician who is trained and experienced in reading chest radiographs demonstrating TB or other diseases of the lung. The 2008 TB technical instructions require a chest X-ray. Um, for women who are pregnant, this chest X-ray can be performed during or after pregnancy, but it must be performed before the civil surgeon um, can complete the examination. Um, the safety of the fetus must be considered in terms of childhood um, cancer. Um, the dose of radiation for a single chest X-ray is so low that we're really not worried about adverse effects on the fetus, um, but uh, other than childhood cancer, which would occur, at a, of course, at a later time. Um, but uh, we do expect that the radiology facility um, would be able to instruct the woman on the uh, pros and cons of undergoing radiation and would double lead shield the woman with a wraparound shield, which is what is routinely required in the U.S. for um, uh, radiating pregnant women. And again, there's no requirement or recommendation for a civil surgeon to refer an applicant to a health department to obtain a chest radiograph. As was mentioned by Rosalind, um, if um, a civil surgeon can't obtain a particular service or um, make a diagnosis or classification, they are required to make a referral, but it would be hard to imagine that there is a place in the U.S. Um, where a health department would be the only place that a chest x-ray could be obtained. I used to practice in a very small rural area, and there were other facilities for chest x-rays 
um, other than a health department. Um, again, here we talk about required versus recommended referral to the health department TB control program. Required referral if the chest X-ray is suggestive of TB disease. And there is a glossary in the back of the TIs which um, lists the findings for active or more suggestive of inactive TB. So it goes through um, cavities, consolidation, adenopathy, certainly miliary disease, but also talks about nodules, whether they're well-defined or ill-defined, uh, retraction. So it lists a, quite um, a variety of findings that can be suggestive of TB. Um, certainly there's required referral for signs or symptoms of TB. And the required referral for extrapulmonary TB um, is so that further investigation can be um, made by a health department if needed. Um, recommended referral is for latent TB infection needing evaluation for treatment. Um, when we wrote these um, technical instructions, we consulted quite frequently and closely with the Division of TB Elimination. And at the time, they felt that uh, we could not require the referral for treatment um, uh, for latent TB infection, or we couldn't require the, rec uh, the referral. Um, for LTBI because not all health departments could provide the treatment for LTBI. So they wanted the referral to be recommended. Um, we, could, we cannot require treatment for LTBI um, because the inadmissible condition is active tuberculosis. It's not latent tuberculosis. And this is something that we're looking at changing in the future. Um, we've had recent discussions with DTBE um, but as it stands, um, based on what DTBE told us at that time, we can't require the referral, and with, based on the regulations, we cannot require the treatment for LTBI. But we do say, and we make this clear three different places in the technical instructions, that it's the responsibility of the civil surgeon to speak with the local health department to find out what their capabilities are. And if the local health department can't treat for latent TB, what are the local health department's recommendations? Can they make referrals to other places that could provide treatment, or can they guide the civil surgeon to do treatment for latent TB infection? So we make clear that there needs to be good communication between the civil surgeon and the local health department. Um, again, here we talk about why refer to the health department, and of course it's because TB, this is for active disease, um, TB is a significant public health problem, especially in the foreign-born. TB patients in the U.S. are now in common in private practice. Um, diagnosis and treatment issues have increased in complexity, um, especially with drug-resistant TB. Um, directly observed therapy is needed for TB disease, and the health department conducts contact and source investigations. This is what the TIs say about the role of the local or state health department um, uh, to provide or arrange training and appropriate um, uh, skin testing technique, uh, provide or recommend experienced radiology departments and radiologists to perform and interpret chest radiographs, evaluate applicants with abnormal radiographs suggestive of TB disease, um, perform or refer mycobacteriology lab work, uh, provide TB case management and treatment, including DOT, and contact or source case investigations, and provide or facilitate the evaluation and treatment of applicants found to have latent TB infection, needing evaluation for treatment. <clears throat> um, this uh, uh, graph is rather busy here, and I just want to draw your attention to the green boxes. And these are the boxes where uh, there is required referral to the health department. And it says up above those blue boxes that um, if the chest radiograph is suggestive of active or inactive pulmonary disease, there is a required referral to the health department TB control program for further evaluation. Likewise, if there are signs or symptoms of TB, regardless of the TST results, um, and this would also say the IVR results, or the chest radiograph findings, there should be a referral to the health department. Um, for radiographic or other findings suggestive of extrapulmonary TB disease, um, there should be a referral to the health 
um, department TB control program to further evaluate for extrapulmonary TB. And um, <clears throat> the recommended referral is for the latent TB infection. And after the referral is made to to you, to the health department, and you fill out your portion of the form, then that goes back to the, um, the as the TI say, um, and actually as the instructions for um, the I-693 form um, say, that then goes back to the civil surgeon, and they're responsible for filling out the remainder of the form. And the instructions for the I-693 form also say that you should receive the entire original I-693 form. The civil surgeon should make a copy of the form and keep that in their office. So you should receive the original with the portion filled out from the civil surgeon saying why there's a required referral. They won't fill that portion out if they refer someone to you for latent TB um, treatment. That's the, the portion on the form that needs to be filled out is only for required referrals. And again, this is a busy table, but it again says, um, and I'll see if I can bring this up to show you, see if I can, yes, so this column here says refer to health department for further workup, and it shows where it's required. Um, but this table actually is a little confusing because it shows that if the person ends up as a Class A, there was a required referral. Um, but it goes down here and shows basically if the chest x-ray is abnormal, there is a required referral. For latent TB, the referral is recommended. And it also tells the civil surgeon then how they should, um, what boxes should be checked on the I-693 form. Um, these are the classifications that are used by the civil surgeon. Um, and these, again, are based on the regulations that Class A is inadmissible. Um, so that would be Class A pulmonary TB disease is inadmissible. And you might ask what inadmissible is in someone who's already in the U.S., but it, and Rosalind could explain this better and, and may at a later time to you, but it means that their process will be held up and they will not be getting their green card to become an immigrant um, until they complete their treatment and then become a Class B. Um, and as I was saying before, following required referral to the health department, the applicant returns to the civil surgeon with your evaluation and treatment results, um, and the applicant must complete treatment before they can be cleared by the civil surgeon, so before their process can continue to get their green card. Um, if they are worked up by you at the health department and their smears and cultures are negative, the civil surgeon can give them a B classification and um, clear them for the um, TB portion of the examination. Um, <clears throat> and after you complete your referral and the civil surgeon signs the form, um, they include your portion that you have filled out when they, they send the form in to the I six nine to um, USCIS. So if you've written anything extra other than um, what is on the form itself, they're required to send that into USCIS. Um, and again, latent TB treatment. Um, the civil surgeon would not fill out the form. Um, referral does not defer medical clearance, and um, starting or um, treatment does not defer medical clearance for the reasons that I discussed earlier. The most common criteria for referral are a TST, I would think, are a TST greater than or equal to 10 millimeters or a positive IGRA, and an applicant from a country with a high TB prevalence and applicants who've been in the U.S. less than five years. But the um, civil surgeon technical instructions include the other criteria for referral, so it would include um, persons with a TST that's five millimeters or greater um, who, um, say, have HIV, or persons um, with a um, TST that is 10 millimeters or, or greater who have certain clinical conditions that place them at higher risk, such as diabetes, um, and in that second category, of course, children less than four years of age. 
um, or children or adolescents exposed to adults in high-risk categories. So this is included in the text of the Civil Surgeon TIs, and it's also included in Appendix C of the Civil Surgeon TIs. Um, so that the civil surgeons, when they are making referrals to the health department, they should include the information about what other high-risk factors are so that you're aware of them. A few FAQs here to um, finish up. Um, if the applicant has an abnormal chest radiograph, what should the civil surgeon do? Um, and all should be referred to the TB control program of the local health department for further evaluation as should applicants with clinical signs or symptoms suggestive of TB disease. Um, should the civil surgeon communicate with the TB control program of the local health department about the availability of latent TB infection treatment? And yes, and this is a long answer that doesn't fit um, on this slide, but as I say, we go through this in three different areas in the technical instructions, that they should contact the TB control program of the local health department to ascertain local policies and procedures, and it goes into talking about, you know, some health departments have more resources than others and um, may have to concentrate on active disease more than latent disease. And can the civil surgeon medically clear the applicant for TB even if the applicant is going to receive treatment for latent TB infection? And the answer is, is yes. And as I say, in the future, this, this may change as we work more um, towards um, you know, we would need a change in the regulations, actually, um, in order to do this. But this is something that, that may happen in the future. And this, of course, would be another way in order to have more people um, receive latent TB treatment and decrease the pool of possible active TB in the future. So to contact us, um, as I said, you can use the long link or you can search for, um, you know, just CDC and civil surgeons. We can be contacted at CDC through CDC Info. And um, I have a picture on the next page here, I believe. This is CDC Info. You just put your subject, your email address, and then your query. Um, they have a roster of questions that we have given to them with answers so that they can answer the easy questions. If it isn't an easy question, then it's bumped up to us. And there are about three of us in, in our group here in DGMQ who answer civil surgeon questions. And um, so I'm one of them. Dr. Drew Posey is another. And Pam McSpadden is another. And um, so I answer questions from civil surgeons this way. I also receive phone calls from civil surgeons. And um, uh, because I've given my card at some of the civil surgeon trainings that we've had on site, um, and in the, in the past, we had those, I believe it was about three or four years ago, and USCIS was able to put on on-site civil surgeon trainings in various cities, and they funded me to participate in those. Um, and they were for civil surgeons and for adjudicators and in some cities for the general public. Um, so those are some of the ways that we have to um, contact. Um, or for civil surgeons to contact us for, um, for information. And also, we do hear from health departments. I don't know how many of you might have contacted us when you have questions about civil surgeon, about the technical instructions or about civil surgeon practices. And we are um, open, of course, to hearing from you and, and from adjudicators also. So, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your presentation on the requirements for civil surgeons related to the TB exam, for clarifying for us so nicely the roles of civil surgeons and health departments. We will next hear from Ms. Kelly Bemis. Kelly is a Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and CDC Fellow with the Connecticut Department of Health. Kelly, the mic is yours. Great. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, as Eileen just said, my name's Kelly, and today I'm going to be reviewing the results of a study we recently conducted in New England, California, and Texas regarding TB screening practices of civil surgeons. 
Before we begin, I'd just like to go over two definitions and abbreviations that I'll be using for the rest of my presentation. And unless you're just joining us, these should look pretty familiar. Status adjusters, who I'll be referring to as SA, are foreign-born individuals who apply to adjust their immigration status to permanent residents while in the U.S. And civil surgeons, who I'll be referring to as CS, are the licensed physicians who perform medical examinations for this purpose. And since Rosalind and Mary have already covered who the civil surgeons are and what they're required to do by the technical instructions, I'd like to introduce our study by discussing our motivations rather than giving you extra background. As Mary touched on in her presentation, the relationship between civil surgeons and the health department is a really Can important. Can you be louder? Sure. So that is TB among the foreign-born is a significant public health and state or local health departments are uniquely prepared to ensure that these cases are treated correctly and to investigate potential transmission. CS screening and the subsequent link to the health department can provide opportunities to identify and treat contagious cases, as well as opportunities to treat latent infections. Furthermore, educating and training CS furthers public health goals such as increasing screening among high-risk individuals and treating active and latent disease. In our study catchment area alone, there were over 200,000 applications for permanent residency filed in 2011. So if we estimate that approximately 18% of these people are infected with latent TB, which is the most recent prevalence estimate available, this means that there could have been around 40,000 opportunities for diagnosis and treatment of TB infection in this group. So given the public health importance of CS screening, the State Health Departments of New England decided to partner with California and Texas to investigate the characteristics and TB testing practices of civil surgeons in our region. We were also interested in whether CS TB screening differed by practice type or awareness of the technical instructions, or TIs. Beginning in July 2011 and ending in May 2012, surveys were mailed to all CS with viable contact information on the USCIS website in Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, which will be grouped together as New England for the rest of the presentation, as well as California and Texas. The CS were sent two mailings and then received a series of follow-up phone calls if their survey was not received. 60% of the surveys were returned in California, 55% were returned in Texas, and 84% in New England. The survey contained questions regarding the CS's medical training and type of practice, their TB screening procedures, as well as two case scenarios in California and Texas and one case scenario in New England. Responses were then analyzed with descriptive statistics, and associations were tested with chi-square, Fisher's exact, or t-test, depending on the type of variable. So now I'll go into our results. The majority of civil surgeons in all three regions were in private independent practice, ranging from approximately 59% in New England to 98% in Texas. The number of years as a civil surgeon and the number of SA evaluations performed were highly variable within each region. However, the medians were similar across the three regions. The majority of survey respondents reported reading the technical instructions. However, there were still 15 to 20 percent in each region who either did not read the instructions or weren't sure if they had. Almost all of the CS used appropriate tests to screen for TB, although EGRS did not appear to be very popular among our respondents. One percent or fewer used test x-rays to screen. However, this proportion rose to over 14 percent in California and Texas when CS were evaluating BCG vaccinated applicants. Also problematic, over a third of civil surgeons did not select the proper cutoff of five millimeters for TSP interpretation and status adjuster exams. Fortunately, when the CS were tested on this same knowledge using a case scenario, which is described in yellow on the slide, around 80% in each region did answer correctly. 
the vast majority of respondents would obtain a chest X-ray for all SA with a positive TST or EGRA as required by the TI. However, many would not obtain chest X-rays for SAs who would be evaluated regardless of TST results. Approximately two-thirds of respondents would obtain a chest X-ray for SA with symptoms suggestive of PD, and under half would obtain a chest X-ray for immunosuppressed applicants. When a CS encounters an applicant with suspected TB disease, a large majority would either report or refer the case to the health department. However, 10 to 20 percent of respondents in each region would not. Furthermore, when asked about a case with an abnormal chest X-ray suggestive of field TB, less than half of our respondents recognize that this applicant would still require referral to the health department for evaluation per the TI. Finally, when CS were asked about their response to applicants latently infected with TB, around 90% would either refer for treatment or start treatment themselves, some encouraging results. In addition to describing behaviors and knowledge, we also looked more in depth at six key study variables to see if they vary by practice type or awareness of the TIs. We discovered that among our respondents, CS in private practice evaluate more status adjusters and are generally more adherent to the technical instructions. However, CS who practice out of community health centers are more likely to recommend LPVI treatment. We also discovered that awareness of the TIs is associated with correctly interpreting a TST and obtaining chest x-rays for all of the groups required by the TIs. However, it did not have an impact on whether a suspected case is reported or whether LPVI treatment is recommended. So to summarize all of those results, the respondents in our survey appear to be moderately adherent with the technical instructions. At the initial screening step, they use appropriate tests but might not be interpreting them correctly. At the screening step, oh, excuse me, proper screening of BCG vaccinated SA could also be reviewed. At the next step, CS are very good at obtaining chest x-rays for SA with positive screening tests. However, they do not always obtain them for immunosuppressed or symptomatic SA. And finally, upon completion of the civil surgeon's evaluation, respondents in our survey were likely to report or refer suspected disease to the health department and to recommend treatment for latent infection. However, it's extremely important that all civil surgeons are reporting suspected active disease and that even ambiguous cases, such as those that appear to have field TB, are evaluated further. These findings suggest that CS would benefit from more frequent trainings on the technical instructions. These trainings should review the major components but focus on recent changes and details that might have been overlooked when the CS reviewed the TIs on their own. Additionally, resources should be provided to help CS handle difficult or ambiguous cases. As Mary mentioned, civil surgeons are already able to contact CDC for questions regarding the TIs, but ensuring that CS also have contact information for their state or local health departments for other questions requiring TB expertise would be helpful. Any communication with the CS, whether it's through trainings or informal discussions one-on-one -on -one with the health department, should emphasize current priorities in TB control such as reporting all active cases or treating latent disease. And finally, we would recommend that health departments try to build relationships with their local USCIS office. These relationships would facilitate information sharing that could be used to target trainings for civil surgeons or to assist in ongoing assessments of their adherence and knowledge. And with that, I can turn it back to Eileen. Thank you, Kelly, uh, for sharing those interesting results of the Civil Surgeons Survey. Next, we will hear from Dr. Felicia Dworkin, the Deputy Director for Medical Affairs in the New York City Bureau of TB Control. She will share a case presentation that will illustrate some of the discussion we have had today. 
Felicia. Thank you for having us speak this afternoon. So we're going to present a case um, that we see patients in New York City all the time. Um, we have five chest clinics that we, um, the Department of Health uses to see TB patients as well as um, patients admitted for being brought from civil surgeons, being referred to them. All right. So the case today is a 79-year-old woman, and she was sent by a civil surgeon for evaluation of a positive TST. The skin test was 10 millimeters, as reported by the civil surgeon, and it was actually reported negative a few years prior, so she would be considered a conversion. Uh, she gave a history of high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, and some esophageal reflux. And on examination and um, history taking, she had no symptoms of signs of TB at this time. And this is her x-ray, and um, here's the pointer. So up here, if you can see, there might be some uh, densities at the left apex, and maybe you could see them on the lateral as well. And here's an apical or dotic view, which shows the uh, densities again. So like I said, uh, the x-ray was reported officially by our radiologist later as having bilateral apical linear changes. Um, there was also a retrocardiac hiatal hernia and maybe an infiltrate. Uh, the physician that saw her in her clinic collected three sputums appropriately as this was a abnormal x-ray. Um, and when we consider anybody for um, as a suspect and we want to collect sputums, we, we have to report that patient as a suspect to our program. The smears actually were negative and the cultures was, were, of course, pending, uh, pending cultures. The civil surgeon actually called our, our physician who saw this patient and asked what was the delay in completing the, the form and the 693 uh, form. And we, we, we discussed this over the phone with the physician saying, you know, when we do a wet reading in our clinic before the official radiologist, um, uh, before the official radiology report comes out, we do a, re a wet reading, which, so the, the actual report takes about a week to come back. Um, and now, because she's waiting for students to be finalized, that takes eight weeks and we weren't going to fill out the 693 form because now she's pending as a possible TB case. So our recommendations actually at that time with the discussion of the civil surgeon was because the patient had x-ray findings that were abnormal and a new positive TST, we actually recommended that the patient can take um, four TB meds for the first two months, and if the cultures were negative, then give INH and rifampin for two more months and be treated for LTBI. Or the patient can actually wait for the cultures to be negative and then take LTBI therapy. And, the, and we would need to decide at that time um, if the culture, if the patient actually had culture negative TB or would we want to consider this patient as having latent infection. So in discussion with the patient, the patient actually chose to wait for her therapy, for her culture results and not take any therapy either for uh, suspected, suspected disease or for LTBI. So just to, just to give an overview of what actually happens in New York City, um, we have, as I looked on the website, there are over 200 physicians that are listed as civil surgeons just in the New York City five boroughs alone. That doesn't include the outlying areas. Patients actually come to our health department clinics after, usually after the civil surgeon has evaluated the patient, done the skin test, maybe have done an x-ray. Usually, um, of course, they usually refer them because the skin tests or the quantiferin are positive. Usually what ends up happening is the x-ray is actually done at our health clinics, at our chest clinics. Um, on occasion, the physician, the civil surgeon, will refer a patient with an x-ray that's already been done. Maybe it's abnormal. It might be actually normal. On the other hand, if the patient only comes with a report, um, and the x-ray is reported as abnormal by report, we will repeat the x-ray in our clinic so we can actually see what the abnormality is. Um, and, and we do this as part of filling out the patient's 693 form. Uh, we only, we usually get um, from the civil surgeon, we usually get a referral, not 
not the required referrals as written out on the form. It's usually sent as a separate referral with the form the patient brings with them. Um, and usually in our clinics, or in my experience, I only get the form, the part of the form that I need to fill out. So that, that tends to be a little concerning because we're not really sure what other conditions the patient may have. Um, and sometimes we actually have to call a physician to find out what else is going on with the patient if the patient doesn't want to give too much information. We also tend to find out that the patient needs the form filled out as soon as possible. And if, it, if there's an x-ray with an abnormality, obviously that's not possible. So we thought this would be a good illustration of, of how we work with civil surgeons. We usually work very well with them. Sometimes we have some difficulties. Sometimes there are concerns. But we usually have a very good rapport with the civil surgeons that send patients to our clinic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Felicia, for sharing this example of, uh, of, of a civil surgeon referral to the New York City Health Department. We now have some time for discussion and questions. Joining the speakers on the panel are Ms. Melissa Lynn from the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services and Dr. Diana Nielsen from the New York City Bureau of TB Control and Dr. Lynn Sosa from the Connecticut Department of Health. I would now like to uh, pose the first question to Dr. Mary Norton. Mary, how are the recommendations in the presentation about the Civil Sur Surgeon Knowledge yeah. Survey being addressed, and what are some other potential opportunities, things such as training, medical management resources, and required protocols for civil surgeons? Thank you all for the presentations. Um, it was, uh, it's quite interesting. And thank you, Kelly, um, for the survey uh, presentation and results. Um, I would say, you know, to address the first question about um, trainings, um, I, I agree that trainings would be more helpful, you know, more trainings would be helpful. And um, I don't know if Rosalind might want to um, say something at some point here. I know USCIS at this point, um, they've conducted, about a year ago, had some webinars that um, we participated in and um, that CDC participated in um, that concentrated a lot on the, on the form, which is what USCIS has to deal with, the I-693 form. And we provided some of the, the medical. Um, if you look at those webinars, I think you'll see a lot about the forms, but what was spoken on about on um, the um, seminars themselves was actually, uh, a lot of it was about the, the medical requirements. Um, but I, you know, and I said before that we did on-site trainings, but, you know, due to fiscal limitations, um, it looks like USCIS may not be able to continue doing those and CDC isn't able to do those. So I think it, it would be great if there are other venues for training and if DGMQ, DTBE, if the RTMCCs um, and, the, and the states and USCIS might be able to collaborate, I think that would be a great idea. I think it would be helpful to have the, the okay. state and local health department point of views, points of view Not included. Really. So I think that um, that would be helpful to be able to collaborate on trainings. And um, I think it also is helpful that in addition to um, a CDC having um, some, you know, for us being able to answer the questions of civil surgeons and, and others, that the state health departments make themselves available, um, not so much to answer questions about the technical instructions, which we realize are very technical because this is a legal examination and the civil surgeons are required to do some things differently than they might do in their other practice or that other physicians would do in their regular practice. Um, but to help, and I, you know, I think Kelly said this, improve, help improve the communication because in RTIs, we say that the civil surgeons should communicate with their local health department. Um, and if the local health departments then would even be, uh, and the state health departments could um, make their contact information more available. I think that would help, you know, from both sides. Um, as far as reporting suspected disease, um, I think most of the time, if the civil surgeons are following the technical instructions, 
um, the diagnosis is going to be made by the health department because they, they won't be doing the smears and cultures themselves. I think it would be relatively rare that somebody would be appearing for an exam where they're symptomatic or where they would actually um, tell the civil surgeon where they're symptomatic because this is an examination for a legal purpose um, to gain um, admission to the U.S. Um, but again, that would be helpful for the civil surgeons to communicate with the local health department um, about who exactly is doing the reporting of, of the case um, uh, so that it's, it's very clear between the two who is doing the reporting. And, um, w you know, we did talk over some, I think, in our individual presentation, some of the current limitations for, um, you know, there is a current limitation in that we can't require um, treatment of LTBI before someone is um, adjudicated and given a green card because the regulations um, address active tuberculosis, not latent tuberculosis. Um, and this is the legal examination according to the regulations. But that may, you know, seems to be something that we will be addressing or may be addressing in the future. It's something that we've um, discussed here at CDC. And of course, please keep in mind that um, the, the wheels turn very slowly in government. Um, this would require a change in the regulations, which means something needing to be um, created, go through many levels of clearance, then go to the Federal Register and get comments. Um, you know, it's a, it's a long process. But it's, it is something um, that uh, could possibly be done in the future um, that would help um, in this regard. So those would be my comments. And I would just have one, um, I do have one question for um, some of the, and this is for Kelly. Um, she could address this at some point. I'd be interested on the fellow who was 42 years old and was Congolese, had findings of granulomatous disease. Um, if you were talking about, if you asked the civil surgeon if that was supposed to be an example of LTBI, and if so, was they, were they asked if they were required to refer or were, were a recommended referral um, needed? Can you? Thank you. Um, so that, but, uh, Kelly, that question then posed to you? Sure. Can, can you guys hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Great. Uh, so that question was added by our California team. So as far as um, the intent, unless uh, maybe one of them is on the webinar today, I, I believe the goal was to test to see whether the civil surgeon would pick up that that was a required referral. Um, the way the question was phrased was the case scenario was presented um, almost identical to how it was presented on the slide, and then we just asked the civil surgeon, what would be your next step? And then we gave them a list of options that included referral to the health department, but it also included things like referral to a specialist, referral to a primary care physician. Um, I believe do nothing was perhaps an option. Um, uh, obtain a CT scan. And so we looked to see um, what, whether or not that referral to the health department box was checked um, either in, in itself or in a combination of responses. Excellent. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we have quite a number of questions that have come in through the uh, question and answer box. So um, one of the first questions uh, I, I think would go to Rosalind, and that question is, is there any recertification process for civil surgeons? Yeah. Um, um, currently, once you're designated and you meet the licensing requirements, um, there are no recertification. Um, what the local offices do, though, they um, it's the local office that um, the lo it, it is the local offices that designate civil surgeons. Um, they do yearly scrubs and um, they also check on the licensing requirements. So, but there is no um, recertification program currently. Thank you very much. Another question, um, which either can go to you or to Mary. In general, um, how much time does it take um, or how much time is allotted for an individual to go through the status adjustment process? Is there a, a time frame in which they need to finish? It depends a 
little bit on when an individual is uh, filing for adjustment of status, but the medical examination always has to take um, take place before the individual even files with USCIS. So um, it's a, that, that medical exam is kind of a snapshot in time on the medical stage, and then the documentation is submitted as part of for the officer to evaluate the medical inadmissibility. Um, there is there is, so it's as much time as the individual needs, and it's as part of the gathering all the required evidence for the adjustment of status package. Okay. It could be that at, at some, so if the if the individual submits the adjustment of status package together with the medical examination, mm-hmm. that an officer would see that something was not done properly, or that an officer might see that some tests were missing. In this case, the Form I-693 is returned to the applicant, and the applicant is instructed to return to the civil surgeon to perform the particular test. Um, In this case, um, there is a time limit on it um, of 87 days. That's the that's but that's really the only time. The technical instructions really function in a way that if the civil surgeon follows everything properly, an individual is not medically inadmissible. So there should be nothing missing at the time they submit the I-693. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I think that does. So then um, there was a, another question about medical inadmissibility, which you may have just answered. Um, and that question was, what happens to applicants that are medically inadmissible and waiver is not granted? Well, that individual would be not be allowed to stay in the United States very technically. But as, as the technical instructions are set up, really individuals are treated for a condition, and then this condition can be reclassified as a Class B, and that does not render an individual medically inadmissible. So if everything follows is a set up through the technical instructions, no waiver should be needed. And has been fairly infrequent based on what Mary also um, confirmed. All right, thank you. Next question is um, uh, relates to temporary visitors. Why don't we require students, temporary workers, or long-term visitors to have any medical screening? Uh, um, so I, I take that question again. So I um, the the numbers of individuals coming to the United States is fairly large. We have uh, I I saw that question and I quickly googled the Office of Immigration Statistics. And we have about 2 million permanent, res, permanently resident, um, in, non-immigrants residing in the United States. And we have over 159 million foreigners coming to visit the United States very brief and temporarily. So that have a mission. And that is admission. It doesn't count as how many people come into the United States. That everybody has to be medically, um, admissible to the United States with such a high number of um, coming in temporarily, it's it's probably more of a risk assessment. It will be a question that maybe goes more towards um, the State Department that issues visa and also um, CBP who admits individuals um, to the United States. But it's just a very large number. If an officer at the border general has uh, generally has the impression that something is wrong with the individual, they will order that the individual is examined. This is Mary. I can also. Um answer that if you would like. Yes, mm-hmm. thank you. Yes, yeah, so this is something that I mentioned earlier where I said we were looking into the possibility of, of screening certain populations of non-immigrants. What we're currently doing is we're looking into which of that, uh, which subgroups of, of non-immigrant um, visa holders uh, have the highest likelihood of developing TB while in the U.S. So one of the um, uh, people in our, our group here has developed a model for looking at this so that, um, you know, as we move, because this is a question that we've asked for a while. Um, so we, while it would be very difficult to screen all non-immigrant visa applicants, you know, that would make our program, uh, looking just at them, not at visitors and at some of those other groups that uh, would be included in that number that Rosalind gave, if um, we were looking just at non-immigrant visa applicants, that would make the program six to eight times larger than it currently is for immigrants and refugees. And so um, we're trying to narrow it down to certain groups that have a higher risk for developing TB within the U.S. and look at the possibility of screening them. Thank you. Um, There's uh, several questions 
that relate to the um, cut point for tuberculin skin tests and the fact that it is um, five millimeters in the um, immigrant screening and generally a 10 millimeter cutoff would be used for foreign born individuals who um, are already in the United States. Can you comment on the use of the different cut points? Uh, yeah, this is Mary again. I can ha comment. The five millimeters is for getting the chest X-ray. So the 10 millimeters is is the same as as you know, the the cut points for LTBI treatment are just the same as 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 used throughout the United States. The five millimeters is for getting the chest X-ray. And what that five millimeters does is it, it does allow you to include for referral for LTBI treatment those people who have um, findings on their chest X-ray suggestive of B because you would refer them for treatment at five millimeters, not at 10 millimeters. So Mary, uh, this is Diana Nielsen. Uh, so in New York City, we actually get referrals for chest X-ray from the civil surgeon that doesn't the group that doesn't do the chest x-ray for the patient. And we we always run into a problem with this because we would not get a chest x-ray for that five millimeter skin test. So I know where you're coming from. And um, mm -hmm. so I think uh, this has always been a big source of debate in, uh, among the people that are doing the actual chest x-rays. Because a lot of this is a referral to us um, for the chest x-ray and the evaluation and the filling of the form. Well, actually, I would say that uh, you should not be getting the referral for the chest x-ray. And I would, you know, if you were the only facility in New York City that did chest x-rays, I could understand why you're getting the referral. But since you're not, I don't, I don't understand why you're getting the referral. I mean, I, I can say I don't understand. I can think of a number of reasons why you're getting yeah. the referral for the chest x-ray. But I think it would be fine for you to tell the civil surgeon that the, the requirement is for them to refer to you if the chest x-ray that they obtain or have obtained okay. is suggestive of TB. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that um, clarification. Another um, question also related to um, tuberculin testing. For refugee post-arrival screening, does this include a tuberculin skin test for children two and under? It's actually what to you, it's up question. to you what you want to do and what your state requires or what your state guidelines are. Um, and actually, I guess we could look up on, you know, I, I'm not involved in that aspect or in the guidelines for post-arrival refugee screening. Um, I know that um, some other members of our division have put up some uh, recommendations for post-arrival TB screening on our website, the DGMT website. Um, but my understanding is the way it goes is often what the state, um, you know, what, what the state guidelines are. Okay, thank, thank because, you. Because actually, you know, the TIs um, don't, you know, we write the TIs for the overseas screening, but then don't follow those overseas screenings which, with what should be done in the U.S. for people who have been screened overseas. Okay, thank you. Um, a question for New York City. Does New York City have any outreach or training programs um, that are directed towards civil surgeons? Uh, no, we don't. Um, we do general world TB days that many of the civil surgeons are on the list, but we do not specifically target uh, civil surgeons. Uh, we have thought about doing it, um, uh, but we have not done it specifically. A question has also come in regarding HIV infection. So, uh, Mary, I don't know if this is um, something that perhaps you can answer, and the question related to why HIV was not considered a Class A condition? Well, as you probably know, it was considered a Class A condition until the beginning of 2010, and it had been considered a Class A condition um, by law. So 
so it was the only Class A condition that had been um, determined in that way. All the other ones had been determined by CDC. And then in 2009, it, it came off. It was no longer a legal requirement that it be an inadmissible condition. And, of course, it meant that it was inadmissible not just for immigrants and refugees. It meant that if you were a visitor, you could not come into the U.S. with HIV, um, is my understanding. And um, it was felt, as, so w what happened was when it was no longer a law, then it gave CDC the opportunity to make the decision about inadmissible conditions um, that we had about every other disease. Um, and it was decided at that point um, that we, uh, it certainly wasn't the situation that it was um, easily transmissible, um, that it um, was a rare condition in the United States. Um, and it was felt that there were many people who were prevented from coming to the U.S. Um, uh, who, you know, simply, you know, for a two-week visit, for an HIV conference, for other reasons, um, who should be allowed to come to the U.S. And uh, it wasn't felt that the public health reasons stood up anymore um, to have it as an inadmissible condition, and so it was removed. Thank you very much. Um, uh, another question has come has come in uh, through the question and answer relating to extra pulmonary TB. Um, again, I think this might go to Mary. Um, is extra pulmonary TB or the suspicion of extra pulmonary TB a referral to the health department? And what are expectations around um, around uh, reporting back to the civil surgeon? That's a good question. Um, it is a required referral to the health department. Uh, the reason for that is that it's felt that it's it's rare enough that um, the health department would have the expertise in doing the workup and that the civil surgeon would not. And again, the civil surgeon should fill out that required referral portion of the form and then the health department would fill out, you have a section there um, where you fill out what you determined um, during the referral. Extra pulmonary TB is a class B condition. So as soon as um, you determined what was going on and the person was started on treatment, then you could fill out the form and send it back to the civil surgeon. It, it, the fact that a person has extra pulmonary TB won't slow um, down the adjudication process, the civil surgeon can sign off on the form um, because it is, by definition, extra pulmonary, not pulmonary, so it's not transmissible and is not considered to be a public health issue. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so I would like to um, open up the phone lines for, we have about five more minutes. If anybody has a question for any one of our speakers and was unable to submit it through the um, question and answer feature, you can um, unmute your phone and uh, through pound six and ask your question. And then please remute yourself after your question is asked. Do you want to do it, do you want to do it by phone? So um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, why do we as health departments have to do the refugee assessment status within a month of their arrival if they've had one done before coming to the U.S.? So let me ask, are you talking about um, some, are you talking about Class B notifications or are you talking about the uh, more general health assessment that you do? The Class B. Well, the, the reason they haven't had a health exam generally, that, I mean, they, they have, it, it's very rare, except for Mexico, that they have had a health exam within a month of entering the U.S. I mean, uh, normally it would be, uh, you know, it would be four months or it would be longer than that um, because they have three months to enter the U.S. after their culture results are returned. 
And for many people, it, it takes that long to get through the process of coming into the U.S. I'm not that familiar with many places where people enter as soon as they have their culture results, which would mean that it is two months after after they had their exam. Thank, um, thank you very much, Mary. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers and discussants today for great presentations and answers to so many of our listeners' questions. And uh, to all of our participants, I thank you for joining us today and have a good afternoon.